Okay. So this week's chapter, as we're nearing halfway through the last course, is basically going to be related to the task list uh, CCRs, the client center responsibilities. It's probably one of the more straightforward chapters with concepts that are pretty familiar because by now you're starting to see things repeat themselves and show up. So I'm going to go ahead and record this because I can put it on the web for those who couldn't join us and cover cover the basic list behind me. Now this this is not a this is not an exercise for ABCs because we're not really going to do a lot of ABCs and function. That's the typical thing to put terms and concepts in their locations. This is more a matter I'm going to kind of review, walk through the list. And what I'm doing is I'm using the front of the chapter to see what the main items were and going through most of those bullet items. I just want to tie them all together for you for your consideration as you work through the study guide. And as I said, it's a pretty straightforward chapter. You're going to recognize it. What I put at the top of chapter 24, I put, put it all together because it's really talking a lot about OBM. Because this chapter and this book is a lot of, does a lot of examples with organizational behavior management, organizations and setting goals for the company and then the employees and checklists and prompting and feedback and shaping and training. So what you're gonna see a lot in this tonight is gonna to be um, examples of how organizations are driven by behavior analytic processes. And in the field of behavior analysis, we have the conceptual analysis, how we talk about the concepts. The experimental analysis is those principles we've derived and observed and discovered from watching behavior of people and other animals. Then we have the applied behavior analysis, what we've mostly talked about. And then a sort of a, a sub area, but related is when you go into organizational behavior analysis. So this again focuses mostly on what I'm gonna call OBM, organizational behavior analysis, where these are considerations. And so what I've got at the very bottom is an exercise to suggest that you know, when we finish, take a look at the chapter and just run down this column of terms. And then just to see how it applies in organizations, notice that in your workplace, your school place, Target, somewhere you go, and just take a look to see how, how could you take what you're observing and turn it into a behavioral model. What do you see working there in terms of supervisors on the floor or training or people on breaks and clocking in, clocking out? Just look at the systems organization, like what's the organization's mission? Even if you're doing services at home with a family, your mission is to help that family come together with cooperation and effective child parent management. And be looking to see how these things are in place. So OBM and ABA are related because organization with your management involves lots of goals and objectives and then developing training systems and implementing and managing supervising. So on the task list, as I mentioned, the section, the second section on the task list are the CCRs, the client center responsibilities, and that's where they go through GHIJK, and G was to identify the problem, H was to decide how to measure it, I was then to assess it, J was to build the intervention, and K is to implement, manage, and supervise that intervention based on the function and based on the behaviors and what, you're, what you'll learn about the function from the, from the plotting the data in baseline. So what that involves is, and the, and the driving concepts I think you'll find for this chapter, and basically for the field, is gonna come back to the chapters you've had on stimulus control and reinforcement. Now my short code is SR plus, stimulus response plus positive reinforcement, and SR minus would refer to negative reinforcement, since anything we do that's behavior, what we do is behavior. Any behavior we do, is being maintained by some kind of reinforcement, whether it's getting access to a person, place, or thing, or getting away from a person, place, or thing. We're gonna do the behavior it takes to achieve what we want at the moment. Get away from, if I'm hungry, I wanna get food. If I'm full, I wanna get away from. So stimulus control is gonna be how the discriminatory stimuli have become powerful enough through the process of pairing the stimulus and the environment. That response, the consequence of that response either reinforces and strengthens the response or if it doesn't get reinforced, extinction, then it weakens it. Or if it gets punished, it weakens it. So you look at these situations, and for the exercise I'm suggesting, is you go to your workplace, school, company, wherever you're working, wherever you see people working, talking with your friends and relatives, look for the idea of stimulus control. What is it in that environment 
from the moment someone walks in the door, that are the SDs that they're going to respond to. Like I used to work in a factory that was building storm doors and windows for trailers and campers. And the first thing we did was come in and go right to the clock and clock in. That way I could clock in and get credit for my hours and get paid. So the first thing I learned once I got hired was go hit that clock immediately. And then when they buzzed the bell for breaks, we took breaks and shifts, I'd hear that bell and realize that's the second break bell and I'm on the second group, so I would go take my break. So looking for stimulus control in various environments, what are those situations and places that set off behaviors? And then looking for reinforcement. How is reinforcement playing a part of supporting the behavior that's been prompted and evoked by the SDs? How is reinforcement maintaining that behavior? So the driving point for this is gonna be, it's ABA, and it's in the organizational types of settings to look around and just see how behavioral is the world. So what we're gonna see with them is things as a behavioral package. So we've got a behavioral procedure made up of behavioral elements, and then a behavioral package is gonna put in together more than one procedure. Most anything we do involves a number of procedures that all go together to make up a response class that all meet the function for performing whatever task we're doing. So we're looking for stimulus control and uh, reinforcement. And so this book uses the term um, like continuously managers as the agent of control. So if we were in the field, we might call them behavior interventionists or RBTs or the supervisors, case managers, the BCBAs. These are the people who are literally managing the contingencies to prompt behavior and do the programming and get the behavior change. If we're teaching a child with colored letters or numbers, we're prompting them to show me red, show me the letter W, what is this letter, name the letter. So we're trying to develop stimulus control that we're going to give the instruction and the stimulus they will respond to and we can reinforce it to develop repertoires. If they've got problem behaviors, we're trying to teach replacement behaviors by pointing to better stimuli, do some stimulus, stimulus pairing to transfer control from the problem to a better way to signal that behavior. And the same in work environments and homes and schools as we're trying to get people to respond to the national environmental cues that go to your classroom. If you're in classroom 104, then you learn to find that room because that's your classroom. So we're going to be looking through these to see how you would implement, manage, and supervise in a setting. Looking for stimulus control, what are the SDs that have been paired to become strong enough to have stimulus control and evoke the right behaviors in the right places, and how are those being reinforced in the natural environment? Initially, we start with contriving a lot of reinforcement, but ultimately it needs to be able to move into a natural environment. The natural environment shows those triggers. I'm hungry, the refrigerator is a good place to go. Once I eat, then I get reinforced for eating and open the refrigerator. So part of the training for if you're the one that's training a family, or training the behavioral team, or training teachers, training clinicians, here are the key. You need to be present. You've got to be present to be an SD. You're going to do some prompting. And remember the prompting, this goes back to earlier chapters, a prompt is anything above and beyond the natural environmental SD. The goal is that in that environment, there are SDs, signals for if I respond to this, this way, under these conditions, I'll get reinforced. So you've got to be present to be an SD, and you need means you need to have paired yourself as a positive reinforcer so that being around you and cooperating with you ends up getting praise or compliments to make things go your way. So being present, present, and then as you are prompting, we're realizing when we have to prompt that the stimulus cue is not strong enough, that, that by itself it doesn't evoke the behavior. We need the SD to evoke the behavior. So use a prompt to get it to happen so you can reinforce it. And then you want to fade that prompt so that the natural environment, the natural SDs will take over. The one thing you've taught them to respond to. I tell children, open your pencil block and take out your eraser. They're going to take out the eraser, not the pen, not the pencil. So we're going to have prompting to get the behavior to happen and then try to fade the prompt because you won't always be able to prompt. We're going to use a lot of feedback, and feedback in the chapter is defined as information on how you did your performance. So it's one thing to say, good job, congratulations, nicely done, with general praise or specific praise. You wrote your name very neatly in the corner of the paper. You put your toys off the floor in the toy box to be specific with praise. But feedback is going to be for information on how you're performing, so maybe on how to change the topography of how you're doing something, or hold the pencil differently. And so feedback is, is not always going to be in the form of praise. Feedback is usually going to be, here's how you're doing, adjust this, so you can give it praise. Now, a lot of times people don't respond effectively, and they're trying to avoid situations because it's too hard, the tasks are too difficult, there's too much to do. 
and that makes it a far seed. So when you say, okay, work 10 math problems, which how fuss is because 10 is too many. So we know how to break that down and say, just work two problems and tell me when you're done. I'll look at it. Now work three problems, tell me when you're done. Do three, four, take a break. So one of the things we do is we watch our performers, our BIs, our RBTs, if we're coaching parents and parent home training, are watching to see what's holding them up. Why are they having trouble following what we think is a simple procedure, realizing just the same as we do an ABC and a functional behavior assessment for the learner, for the client, or the student, here's how you do it, what's the function. We do the same thing for the people that we're supervising and managing. There's a reason the parents are not trying the technique the way you suggested. It's too hard to understand it. It's too complicated. So the idea we need to remove we, we need to remove the negative reinforcers. Those stimuli that signal you'll be reinforced for escaping or avoiding this task or this situation. We've got to find a way to minimize that so they're not always avoiding things they need to be doing. And then that makes you a reinforcing agent because I've taken the set of say in 10 problems, I've broken down two or three. So I'll tell a parent to use a five minute fixed time non contingent reinforcement schedule. I tell them check in on them every so often and just make a comment how it's going. What are you doing? Tell me what you're doing. So we're doing a more doable, easier task to do so it doesn't seem overwhelming and impossible. Then this next piece is about combining the feedback with the prompts. So here's how you're doing. Remember to put this, if I'm teaching a guy in a drill press, remember to slide the, the metal into the template against the corner, then turn the knob and then pull the handle. So I'm going to provide the feedback. I'm going to prompt the behavior so I can reinforce it. The key to about any behavior change is we need to get the behavior to occur. And if we have to do hand over hand or physically gesture or say it, if it doesn't occur, we can't reinforce it. And while we want the natural SD, the natural environment to evoke it, if it doesn't happen already, we just can prompt it to get it to happen. Once we can get the response connected, temporal contiguity, the response close to the reinforcer, that'll strengthen that response under those conditions. And then we fade the prompt so the SD is enough to trigger the behavior. So we're going to combine feedback prompts and reinforcement. Then, of course, that means we're going to have to provide some feedback and reinforcement. You'll notice reinforcement is simply a big part of everyday life. Everything we're doing and need done needs to be reinforced on an effective schedule. So now to maximize the feedback, another section of the chapter talks about we need to be constructive and precise. And one of the premises for our field is constructivism. And when you did the FKs, the FK 1 through 9, we are looking at the lawfulness of behavior and selectionism. Behavior comes from genetics and in cultural environments. We look at determinism, happens for a reason. Empiricism it has to be measurable and definable. We look at pragmatism, it has to be practical, pragmatic, it has to work. Does that actually work? Is that a workable procedure? And constructivism is not listed on the task list, but behavior analysts should realize that what we do is based very much on constructivism. We want to come up with constructive approaches, and by constructive we mean doable statements versus don't. So we want to construct a set of behaviors and responses that can be done that are simple and small steps. So being constructive and precise means we're going to give it in terms of do this, do this, do this, instead of don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this, and don't do this. They're all non-behaviors. So we can say avoid this, but we want to try to construct a doable statement, very clear imperative instruction. And we want to be precise so we're very clear about when to do it and not to do it. The other part about maximizing feedback is the source. And when you're the trainer, you're the primary source for reinforcement. But keep in mind we have other reinforcing sources. And you'll see that towards the end of the chapter when it talks about families and peers and clients and supervisors. Anybody in that environment that can be part of a feedback loop or part of a reinforcement loop are going to help maximize the effectiveness of feedback. The form of feedback can be a smile, a gesture, a high five, a thumbs up, an email, a, a, a reward, a simple reward can be a sticker for a child working. So the idea of the form of feedback, or even if I just point to something that can guide them to the right place to respond to make that BSD. And of course, the timing of feedback needs to be close to the behavior. If it's too delayed, then the connection is too weak. If we don't have the temporal contiguity of having the behavior, the consequence behavior, and the feedback, and they don't make a strong connection. We're trying to get the, the SD, the behavior and the consequence to be a nice tight little unit of analysis and all three happen together. The next thing is going to be the goal setting. And the key here for goal setting in all cases that I'm aware of is collaboration. If I come in and say, here are the goals I want you to meet, that's not always going to meet what you want. So with 
with collaboration, I'm trying to say, here's, here's, here's the situation. If it's a company, what's our mission? To provide customer service, to provide good products, to, to fix things that break immediately. So I want to know what the mission is, and then we set the goals. And if I set the goals for your aspect of the job, or set the goals for the parent, here's how to manage your child on a token system. So look for the things that are doable, construct doables, don't put don'ts on there. And then make sure that you're looking for good behavior, and make sure you're reinforcing good behavior. So we're gonna set goals for the parent to be able to look at that, that list of things they want the child to do, those house rules or those chores. We're watching for those, and every time we're seeing them happening, we're trying to give feedback and reinforcement. On it. So we need to get the goals set collaborative, so we're meeting the goals of the parent, the goals of the teacher, the goals of the client, the goal of the employee, What's their goal? To be, if you're in that setting, you want them to do something. If we're not meeting their goals, then they're not very interested in what we're saying or doing. The next piece again is prompting, as I mentioned. This is a summary and a callback. For now that we've gone through the chapters of the terms, the concepts, and talked a lot of procedures, how to make more behavior, how to make less, prompting again comes in again. It's, it's pretty much repeating itself throughout this chapter. Be ready to prompt as necessary, but you've got to be vigilant and develop a clinical savvy to not over prompt. Prompt only as needed, delay a little bit to see that you're not jumping up too quick, but don't let too much time pass. So that's just a clinical judgment for the person you're prompting to make sure you're giving them time to figure it out, but not so long that they get distracted. And the other part is, again, here they are together, prompting and reinforcement. And they showed up earlier, they show up earlier in the chapter, combining feedback prompts and reinforcement, providing feedback and reinforcement and then to maximize your feedback. Again, we're prompting and reinforcing. And then as I mentioned a moment ago, the idea is to be aware of in any environment, what are the potential sources of reinforcement? So I, I use, again, the SR plus is my short form to say stimulus response plus positive reinforcement. And the chapter talks about, and they give examples in each paragraph, how using family members as part of the support system, peers, school peers, or peer playmates or neighborhood kids, uh, clients, supervisors, managers, these are all people that are there to become sources of reinforcement. Because when you go in, develop a program, and coach people through it and get it in the repertoire, you've got to fade out your prompting and you, as a contingency manager, so the people in the national environment, the teacher, the parent, the clinician, the manager, the supervisor, are the people who would normally be the SD, the triggers, the behavior, and they reinforce the behavior. So we want to take advantage of natural things that happen in natural environments because those are going to be the sources around when we're not around. Finally, the, uh, and that's my last bullet point here, is in the end, what we need is behavior to happen as naturally as possible in a natural environment. So whether we're in school or home in the community, there are a lot of stimuli around us. We've got to learn how to teach our clients to respond to the right things, how to open doors, which way to pull, push or pull. I still see people in society walk right up to a push door and pull or pull door and push. And even though it says it right on the door, some doors pull, some doors push. Of course, the door that you pull when you're coming out pushes, so it's easy to get mixed up. But the natural environment will reinforce pulling when the door pulls out, otherwise you've got to switch it. So we're trying to realize in a natural environment there should be cues, we do our training to get people to respond to those natural environmental situations, and tie all that together with setting the goal, collaborating on work on the procedures, combining, combining the packages, little behavioral packages and procedures, and then, then giving feedback on it, reinforcing it, fitting the prompts, getting the sources of natural reinforcement to take over, and that way we now have natural environments cueing behaviors that are reinforced naturally. So back to my starting point was the idea of this I see as an exercise for yourself to try to go to the front of chapter 24, take a quick look through the terms and bullets, and then just the next time you walk in the door at work, you walk in the door somewhere, it's a grocery store or a Target or somewhere, just take a moment and look and see how the employees are working. And watch to see how they respond. If someone sees you, they come up and they offer you help. I went somewhere the other day and I asked them, and the clerk actually walked me right to the shelf to the thing I needed. That was very helpful. I was just out of town traveling at a conference last week, kind of like, pulled up to rent a car and I walked in and gave my name. I was impressed with how quickly, since I'm an express member, they pulled up and handed me my little packet with my paperwork in it within a minute, if not quicker. And as I walked out the door and they said, go out and see Ronald, he's gonna help you. I walked out and showed him my thing and he just pointed to one of his cars and walked me to the car. Well, there was, in that I saw how well that system of management for that organization for the rental car place 
greeted me when I came in, asked my name, immediately looked it up. They had my paperwork ready. I had reserved it. Got it in my hand in record time. Immediately told me the name of the person outside to go ask for. So I said the name. The person turned, walked up to me. I showed them that. They showed me my cars. So the one I wanted wasn't there. They could upgrade me. And they're standing in one of these. And I'm kind of looking at it. and kind of hesitating. And then they walked me to the car. Said, How about this one? So there I was. And of course, being a behaviorist for the last 45 years, I'm always noticing systems and processes and procedures and prompting. And uh, so I'm going to suggest to help understand the chapter is just for an exercise. Next place, next time you're in a place, just kind of look around to see what are the SDs that are triggering the behavior, but particularly at the organizational people, or the people in store service systems or companies or grocery stores or food services, and see how they're responding naturally. And just and then if that, and then as you go through the chapter and read it you'll see them more examples and some of the research cited and examples of other sources of reinforcement. So as I said, this is basically a, a pretty straightforward chapter because there's not a lot of technical terms. Almost everything in here is pretty familiar by now. There's still going to be a few new things coming up. But at this point in this book, we're getting towards the last 10 chapters. Now we've got like six to go and they're going to be pulling these concepts together and they'll keep making sense. I got a lot of comments from 602 that the things that were just 